something kind of really different happened to me this morning. I haven't even had ch- I didn't even uh, have even really talked to Kathy about this, uh, but I I have been praying in my personal life, uh, and you know we've been we've been praying for a lot of things in our world. Uh, we've we've got elections coming up, and we've been praying for that. And uh, we listened to a, a deal today on on uh, an interview with. Uh, I get a kick out of Dr. Phil. He has a program called Fill in the Blanks, and uh, it's, it's really quite good. Uh, and I'm not sure where his Christian roots are, but he has is, he is declared uh, Jesus as his Lord of his life, and it's kind of interesting. But uh, So he's doing this, uh, these programs. And, but uh, the last couple days I've been praying, uh, especially after Sunday. We had such a great Sunday morning, Sunday night. Uh, just a neat time of prayer on Sunday night. And we've been emphasizing prayer a lot and uh, trying to keep up with everybody on the prayer list. is not always easy, but we're trying anyway. But uh, this morning I woke up rather early. Now, I've, uh, when I was a kid, I did some crazy things. Anybody do some crazy things when you were a kid? How many do some crazy things now as an adult? Okay, well, at least we have, there's two of us. Okay, Ruth and I are the only ones who are confessing, but I know the rest of us are in that category somewhere. But uh, this morning I woke up and uh, I was praying and I was seeking God. And, and even through Kathy read our devotions today and we listened to a couple videos on YouTube as part of our devotions. We had a long, longer devotion today than usual. But this morning about four o'clock I woke up and I had, uh, I usually do pretty good. Uh, I, I'm sleeping on a wedge and that helps my back. And but usually in the mornings I wake up and, and I'm feeling some pain from the, the night. And so so this morning I thought, well, I won't go downstairs and lay on the infrared pad that I bought for Kathy. <laughs> I bought her a nice pad that, and uh, I use it more than she does. But this morning uh, I just thought, well, I'll, I'll just sit up and I'll, I'll use a heat pad and a vibrator and, and I'll be fine. Uh, and I had uh, several things on our agenda today, as we all do. And so as I was sitting there, uh, leaned against the couch there, I sat up and uh, turned that thing on and, and thought, well, I could probably doze back off to sleep. It's still early for me. Uh, Seven o'clock is still early for me. But uh, anyway, as I was, uh, it, it goes for about a 15 minutes and it shuts off. And so, but just as I sat up, I was praying. I'd been praying kind of uh, the last couple of days and uh, in, a, in kind of a point of, did you ever have a, a focus that you pray about uh, and you just every day you focus on that thing and I and I thought after Sunday morning uh, with Ankrum we had a wonderful service God just moved in a marvelous way and then Sunday night uh, our prayer service was just dynamic as different ones prayed and uh, and I was excited about that and I said Lord if, if our prayers and, and Gary Ankrum said something to me over lunch he said uh, he said, you guys have been praying a lot and, and God's going to honor your prayers. So this morning as I woke up and I'm feeling a little pain in my back, you know, uh, and I said, okay, Lord, honor my prayer. Just touch my back. Just touch my back today. I've got so much to do and I don't want to be uncomfortable today. I, I, I've got some things that we want to do today. And so I turned on the vibrator, went back to sleep. 15 minutes later, I woke up. Uh, when the vibrator goes off, it kind of, you know, stirs me because of the noise and and I realized I didn't have any pain. I didn't have, and all day I have uh, not had any pain till about five o'clock. I came over here, five five thirty, and as I was walking over here to turn everything on, and I spend a few minutes in prayer, especially when I'm speaking. Sorry, you're stuck with me tonight. Everybody's on vacation who speaks, so uh, except for you guys, and and uh, so anyway, uh, so I decided uh, as I was walking over, I. St- Oh, wait a minute, that, that's coming back. It's like, devil, get out of here. Just put your head back in that hole and just get out of here. I'm not going to accept this pain in my body. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I started going back to that scripture many times. of, I am the very temple of God and the presence of God dwells within me. And I begin to pray that way. And within a few minutes, the pain was gone. And I haven't had pain all day other than about two minutes. And I said, Lord... I was asking for a sign that we're going to see more and more things happen in our church and in our community. And that was kind of a sign to me. 
And then I realized what I'm speaking on tonight. And I thought, wow, God's given me a different perspective of what I'm going through. And so that's what our, our deal is tonight. Uh, you know, we're on the series, Feeling Secure in a Troubled World. And our theme for tonight is a proper perspective in a time of trouble. And so, and as I studied this out, I thought, oh my goodness, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Charles Stanley is, is a wonderful expounder of the word, and, and his book is just great. That's, that's the book that we're all taking this from. And I realized um, there's three questions I kind of asked God today in uh, the last couple of days as I've been studying this. And maybe that's why it's been so prevalent on my mind. I don't know. But the three questions are this. And uh, of course, we're, we're still on our theme of John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And, and as I was talking to God about this scripture, I said, God, I've been faithful to preach this scripture all year. Our team has been faithful to, to preach this scripture, that your fruit should remain. I want to see fruit in my life. I want to see not only myself, I want to see people in our church lay hands on each other. Uh, you know, and I, I, I laugh at that because so many times people call and say, Pastor, if you, just, if you could just pray for me. And it's like, well, everybody in this church technically is a prayer warrior. Everybody in this church is a prayer person. And so if I'm out of pocket, if I'm out of reach, my phone's not working, or the battery's dead, which happens once in a while. Sometimes I don't charge. I got up one morning, I realized I had almost zero on my battery. It was like one or two. And by the time I got it charged, you know, that, and I was doing other things, I had missed several calls, but... Every one of us have the authority of God in our life to lay hands on the sick and be recovered. And then I, I finished reading. Fruit should remain that the Father may give you whatever you ask him in my name. So three questions I have for you tonight. Now, uh, Joel and Ruth are reading the book with us, and they're going to say, well, where did you get all this? This isn't all from that book. I, but the, here it is. The, the three questions I want to ask you today is, first, what am I learning from my present trial? What am I learning through what I'm going through right now? What am I, and, and all of us have trials, all of us have tribulation, all of us end up some kind of pain. Uh, I can guarantee you that Everett learned not to stand too close to that calf next time, as it, it, it kicked him and knocked him down put a few bruises on him. You know, that's a learning experience. So he learned something there, didn't he? I remember one time uh, uh, I learned uh, several, I, on the roof, I, I was breaking in a new guy and I didn't give him good enough instructions. And as we were felting the roof, he felt it over a fireplace and just and nailed it as he went. Well, he pulled it tight and you couldn't see there was a hole in the roof. So I'm the next one to go by and guess what I do? I step in the fireplace. And part way down, I caught myself, and I was pretty banged up. My arms were pretty scratched. And so I, I thought, well, I could be mad at him, but actually, he's the rookie. I'm the pro. I'm the guy teaching him. I'm the mentor. He's the mentee. I don't know if that's a word, but anyway, it is tonight. And so I calmly pulled myself out of that fireplace pit and kind of, you know, brushed myself off. And of course, you know, when I'm young, I, I thought I was tough and Blood didn't bother me as much, and so I went on. But uh, what, when we climbed down after we got the roof felted, I said, you know, there's something I neglected to tell you that could have been a life threat to me, and, or to you, or to anybody you're working with, is when you pull that felt tight, cut out the fireplace so that hole is evident. And he goes, oh, I never even thought about that. Well, I had never taught him that. So whose fault was it? Mine. Now, common sense should have told him too, but his age was working against him. He was just a kid. And of course, I was much more than a kid. But uh, So I learned a lesson there. Everything we go through should give us a lesson. Number two, how would God possibly want me to react in this situation? How should I react to this? We can react many different ways. And number three, how do I bear fruit that should outlive my circumstances? 
my life. And so here we go. Are you ready? Our vision statement is, is pretty simple. Uh, number one is that we are to encourage all those who walk in, in the kingdom. Kingdom ministry, that's part of what we do. We encourage, we uplift. Number two, we are to equip each other, prepare for active duty, because God's kingdom is not a dormant thing. We are active in his kingdom. Tools for everyday living. That's what the pulpit is all about. That's what, uh, when, when you listen to, to teaching over YouTube or Facebook or the radio, those, those are things to, to build our faith. Tools. And then to engage, empowering us to launch out into our going forward with those tools and making them part of who you are. I can give you a hammer and nail, but if you never use them, they're worthless. Amen? Boy, it's your quiet out there. So it's part of our responsibility as a church. So how do I reaffirm my position in Christ? How do we do this? Who are we? Uh... As a person, as a body, uh, who are we in the body? Who are we? You know, just exactly. Uh, and I've been, I've been talking to you several times about the script of our life. When a movie star or, uh, or a commercial, they're given a script to go over so that they can do their lines. What is the script for my life spiritually? What is my responsibility in, in, this, in this world? Well, there's an old saying, think first, react later. Does it apply in all things? I don't know. You, uh, we may ag agree or disagree on that. How about when we're angered? Is it good to think first and react later? Probably is. I read this great story. I want to share it with you. Uh, it said, imagine someone in the midst of a heated argument. Their face is red. Their voice is raised. Their hands wildly gesturing. Losing all sense of composure over something trivial. Do you know that they, they're saying about 85% of what we lose our temper or lose it is over trivial things, things that won't matter tomorrow, things that won't matter an hour from now. Isn't that an interesting stat? So only about 15% that we lose it over is valid, and, and is that even valid? Will it be that valid in a week from now? We don't know. But then it went on to say this. It said... Uh, like a misplaced set of keys. Oh my goodness. Anybody ever misplaced their set of keys? I did that the day and I went, oh, where are those keys? Where is, I always misplace my phone. In fact, I left it in the sound booth tonight. Uh, I, I'm just constantly laying it down and say, honey, seen my phone? She said, let me call it. Oh, there it's ringing. It's downstairs. Sometimes I don't hear it ring. Oh, you know what? I was over here at the church. I better let, and so I come back and find my phone. Uh, you know, and, it, and I get aggravated with myself. Anybody get aggravated with himself? Wow, I guess I'm the only one. Whew, okay, Ruth, you and I are the only honest ones in here. Anyway, and so we do that. And so the image is not unbecoming, but it also illustrates the folly that Proverbs 14, 29 warns us about. It's a scene where patience is lost and with it, wisdom and understanding. Have you ever noticed that when you get angry, wisdom and understanding just seems to flee out the door? Isn't that amazing? Now that's just one example. I'm just using, there's many examples. Patience is often undervalued in our fast-paced world. Instant gratification, microwave. What did we do without the microwave? I mean, goodness. The other night we had leftovers from the night before, the microwave. Everyday frustrations, things that, uh, do we exhibit patience in everything? It's choosing to respond rather than react. Now, I'm pretty cool overall, but get me in traffic. And I tell everybody how to drive. Slow down there, speed up. You better turn, you're, in, you're slowing the traffic. Can't you see how many people are behind us? You know, you're going 40 and a 60. Fortunately, they don't hear me. Kathy does, <laughs> but they don't. So Proverbs 14, 29 says this. He who is slow to wrath is of great understanding but he who is hasty of spirit exalts folly. Wow, we lose all sense of direction. First Samuel 25, 29. Even if a man rises to pursue you and seek your life, the life of my Lord will be found in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. 
But the lives of your enemies he will sling out as from the hollow of a sling. I find that scripture real interesting. That's not our culture to use that terminology. We think of a sling, I think, <laughs> a little thing with a stick with a Y with rubber bands, you know, when we made as a kid or, or even maybe, uh, you know, uh, heavy duty when they can put a marble in it. And some people hunt with, they, they, they can kill small game with, with the sling. But let's examine the word sling. Let's, let's go through this real quick. What do we learn from the scripture? David found himself in a compromising situation. He had to decide whether he wanted to follow God and not kill King Saul because he had several opportunities to take Saul's life, many opportunities, or follow what his men were telling him to do or take it upon himself and take the throne. Hmm. His men said, hey, there's your shot. He's in the cave. He's helpless. You could come up behind him and he's gone and you can take the throne. This is his men speaking. And they were supporting David. They, they didn't mean it in a negative way because their lives were at stake too. And David said, no. He's God's chosen. He, he is anointed. I will not take his life. And then you know the story. Several, in this particular story, after he came out from the cave, uh, David had snuck up close enough to cut off part of his garment, part of his robe. And as Saul was rejoining his men, he comes out with the knife in one hand and the garment in the other hand, says, Saul, I could have, king, I could have done you wrong, but I chose not to. That moment, Saul was soft, and he, wow, he, he was humbled by that, but it didn't take him long. So the first notation about this scripture, the bundle of the living. How many have ever read this before? I've read it several times, but I've never studied it till I got ready for tonight. And it simply means that your soul, your inner man, your body, your person, everything about you is cherished by God. Because after all, he made you in his image. You are cherished. I thought of that song, Cherish. Now I won't sing it to you. It's a secular song by the Letterman. Remember, Cherish is the word. That, you know, remember? I guess I was the only sinner that listened to secular music. But anyway, so it, it, he cherishes us as a body. He cares for you. So he cherishes you. And then you look at the second notation. A sling is a weapon of warfare. Why does, Ab uh, why does Abigail, she's using this as an example, because it doesn't teach us about how God will resolve your trials. The imagery of God is casting away David's enemies. He will prevail. He will cast his enemies like a sling cast. And think about that. Now, we think of a sling shot, but a sling is a, is a pouch, a leather pouch, with cords tied to it that are even, exactly even, and with knots tied on the very end so you can grip it. And what they would do, and, and as I saw the illustration, it's really interesting, and David did this as well as anybody who's ever used a sling. They would take and put one across the hand and close their hand with the other one dangling. And then they would take these two fingers and cross that one and make sure the ends were were even, and close on them. Then they put the rock in there, and they begin to sling it. And, and as you study this, the sling, the power in the slingshot is just not letting it go. It's whipping it as you let it go. And you have to be the proper timing. If you let it go too quick before you actually throw the whip into it, what does it do? It just kind of goes anywhere. If you let go after the whip, it just goes to the ground. So you have to, you have to release it at the right time. Powerful, isn't it? You think about it. And, and this is what he says. It, that, that It's just like he will sling out from the hollow of a sling. Wow. David knew how powerful a slingshot could be. He understood. He understood what this meant. <laughs> it was just a uh, interesting thing. To be patient is not to be passive. We have to understand that it's a courageous act of self-control, choosing to respond rather than react. It's about delaying immediate judgment of anger or discouragement or trauma, delaying it 
more time to think about it and then put the wisdom back in it. I'm pretty hard on myself. I'm pretty hard on myself. And so are you. I imagine you are too. So in everyday life, there's so things that come, that come my way from there. I don't know about you, but when, when you know, I, 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 I was working in construction in Toronto, I was such a good guy to work for. And we were up and I hate hiking. I, I don't think it's God's will to get me hired at five feet up and down. You know, I get up and I... But all of a sudden, something happened to my thumb. It began to swell. It began to bleed more. And all of a sudden, it had this boom, boom, boom. And oh, my goodness, it began to hurt. Fortunately, by then, Elmer had it wrapped with gauze. And he said, you're done for the day. Go home. You're done for the day. And I was like, but just two minutes ago, I was fine. Well, two minutes ago, I was still up in the cold weather. But when you get by the fire, it warmed up. My perspective was on where I was right there at that moment, not reality. And when I got down, reality soaked in pretty quick. Life's frustration. So our goal, our, our, our goal is to be calm in the middle of a storm. It's not always easy. We, uh, we're displaying understanding and wisdom rather than folly. That's what the scripture just said. Four facts to remember. I love this. Uh, no problem has the power to rob us from our victory in Christ. No problem, no issue. Nothing has the ability to rob us. We rob ourselves of that. Number two, no difficulty can do more harm than Christ can remedy. I said Sunday, sometimes we think, well, God, can you handle this? Yeah, God can handle pain. He knows all about pain. He understands pain. He can handle it. Number three, no trial can resolve uh, our saving power of Jesus Christ. It, it can't. It, there's no problem. It, it's Jesus is our, is our answer for everything. He is the healer. And number four, no pain or heartache is too great for Christ. We can overcome it. We can get through it. Psalms 121.8 says, The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from now and for what? Forevermore. In other words, it's not just this very moment. Or not just this week, but for eternity, forevermore. Hmm. So no, my second point in this is that we are reaffirm that your trial or situation will be profitable, but undesirable. I haven't had anybody tell me that survived COVID that it was a pleasant experience. I haven't had anybody tell me that. So there's two viewpoints that we can have in any, anything we face. <laughs> a person believes that a trial is unsolvable, devastating, calamity, something we can't handle, or we believe that a trial, we may learn something from it, and we can do all things through Christ. We will get through it. We will make it on the other side. There is, there is hope. So I, I made two notations about that. First of all, in order for you to assist in the healing process of another person, you have to be healed. I was talking this over with a person a couple days ago and, and about the healing process. And, 
And you know, once you work through something, you can help somebody else work through it. And that's crucial for us. And sometimes we don't get through it. And so we can only bring somebody along as far as we are. And that's an interesting thing. And sometimes, you ever feel like you were pulled through a knothole? Backwards, maybe? I don't know. But anyway, uh, and then second of all, a person believes a trial that he may learn something from it who can help somebody as well. So healing does not mean that you forget. It just simply means you forgive. Have anybody hurt you? Said something to you that just crushed you? I don't know about you. I've had that happen. I've had people do things to me that were, that were not only crude and rude, but simply not even moral. Do I want to hang on to that or let it go? That's kind of where we, we come from. Uh, I tell people, all the, I use the word backpack because that was used with me when I got saved. The, the evangelist who prayed with me and my pastor who prayed with me said, Jim, it's time to get rid of the backpack. Not, let's just not take two or three things out of the backpack. Let's get rid of the backpack. Let's get rid of it all right now. That's easy to say, harder to do. But that night I determined I was going to let go of the backpack. Took a few years to get the residue out. Took a few years before I could say, I think I wanted to face that person and say, I love you, I forgive you, I understand. And that's only because of the training that I had to understand what they were going through, to know I didn't want that as part of my life. I didn't want bitterness to, to corrupt my life. So I made a choice. A lot of people don't make that choice. We have to recognize each problem and where it came from, the origin, origin of it. And everything comes from the enemy that's that, like that. Some problems are sowing and reaping. Sometimes we do things crazy and we, we reap what we sow because of our actions or, or what we say and do. But not always. Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. So if I sow bitterness, I reap bitterness. If I sow unforgiveness, I reap unforgiveness. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he was tried, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Did you ever have your faith tasted? Or tasted, tested? In high school, in my junior year, a kid came up to me and picked a fight with me, and I cleaned his plow. I mean, I just, you know, I, I, I wasn't a Christian then, and boy, the only way out is if someone stays down, and it was going to be him. The very next year, he came back and tried to pick the same fight, and I wanted so bad to do part two. This is the testing for me. And I'll never forget it because one of my best friends, Brian West, who took me to church many times, that little Volkswagen, he'd pick me up, didn't give me a choice, said, get in, I'm taking you to church, let's go, be ready or I'm going to come in and I'll get you ready, you're going to church with me. And so I did. And, and there was Brian standing there, he had, he'd come to the school to see me, of all guys, he'd already graduated the year before, and he came to check on me, see how I was doing, say hi, I hadn't seen him in a while, and we were good friends. He lived about a mile away, but we never saw each other. Anybody ever deal with that? And so, uh, and as he walked up, here comes this other kid. And he started the fight all over again. This year, he was determined to take me down. I thought, I'm no different. I'm just as strong, but I learned something. I had lost the hate and bitterness in my heart. Because my bitterness wasn't towards him anyway. He was just a bully. And I said, you know what? I don't really want to fight you, Mike. I'm going to walk away. Please do not push me into a fight that you will regret. And he's, well, didn't the Bible say turn your other cheek? You're a Christian now. I should just whip up on you. And I said, you know what? Yes, it does say turn the other cheek. But the Bible says nowhere to take a beating. I will not take a beating from you. You take the first swing, it's over. Leave me alone. And I turned and walked away from him kept thinking any minute he's just going to pounce on me. I think his mouth was probably wide open 
and flies were going in. I'm not sure. And I looked out of the car of mine and I got clear down the end, caught up with Brian. We walked outside. Brian says, wow, you didn't do that last year. Why? Because I'm a different person. I'm understanding more things about the scripture. I, I'm growing in Christ. I'm understanding that's not part of my life anymore. And I developed something in me that gave me the courage to walk away from something in the flesh. I wanted to say, well, hey, bud, I'll show you again. But that wasn't me anymore. I'm a, I'm a new creation. And, and there's a growth. My faith was tested. My life was being tested at the moment. When we got outside, Brian said, you know, you did not fail the test. You made it. I thought, you know, I did, didn't I? Felt good. Oh, yeah. Mm, yeah, I felt real good about that. And that's what happens when we're victors. Hebrews eleven seventeen. by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. I think Abraham would have understand Christ dying on the cross and the love that his father, God the Father, had because he was in the same position. The difference was Jesus was our Lamb of God. Isaac was a test. God had no intentions on Isaac dying that day. No intentions. But he was testing. He was testing. And we read about it still today. We read about it today. We see how Abraham is an overcomer. We do too. The last thing I want to share with you just before we close it out. Trials are not punishment. So many times you say, what have I done wrong, God? Peter regarded trials as a time of testing. A refining like gold. Pure gold only happens after it's refined. The word genuine means to be authentic, real, or sincere. The word unspeakable means you can't express it with your words or knowledge. Remember that song we sing? It is joy unspeakable, full of glory. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 8. In this you, are greatly, you greatly rejoice, even though now, for a little while, you have had to suffer various trials. Wow. In order that the genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tried by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor in the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then he wraps that up with this the verse 8. Whom, having not seen, you love, and whom, though you have not seen him now, you believe and you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. If I ask you this question, Dad, get some various answers, I'm sure. What is genuine faith? And why is it more precious than refined gold? The answer, that's how faith is required many times. Purification process. We don't understand it. I wish I did. When we see our trial against the eternity background of someday in heaven, then it's not as big. When we refocus on Jesus, our future in heaven, the perks of knowing Jesus as our Lord and Savior, it's not as big. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. For this reason, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. Our light affliction, which lasts but a moment, works for us far more exceeding in eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Mm. Look for ways that your faith can increase. In every situation, good or bad, sowing and reaping. I read this a while back and I thought it was so good. I wanted to share it with you tonight. It's so paralleled with, with where our lesson was going tonight. First, anticipate that your faith will work. Believe in yourself. That's sometimes hard. Believe in yourself. 
Believe that your faith will grow stronger as a result of what's happening in your life. And we will use our faith to increase and it grows and becomes stronger. Second of all, the more we use our faith, it grows stronger. Third, anticipate your faith will grow. Don't let it be a stumbling block, let it be a stepping stool. The Bible describes three levels of faith, and I never quite saw it like this, and, and I, I really thought this was good. Little faith. Those who believe that God can help them and hope that he will. Great faith. <laughs> Those who believe that God will help and that he will help. Perfect faith. Those who believe that something is desired by God God said it in his word, so therefore, it's as good as done. I want perfect faith in my life. I think I have great faith, but I want perfect faith. <laughs> it's as good as done. Last but not least, as our relationship grows with Christ, the closer we become to Christ, the greater our faith becomes. The relationship it's, and, and I go back to Tim Tebow's book. It's not who we are, but whose we are. The more we see of Christ in the middle of our life, the more victorious we are. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18. It's a real good, I love it. It's, it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of Christ. Jesus concerning you. We watched the other night. We went. I, I came in and I said, you know, I want to watch Grace Card again. And it's a great movie. If you haven't seen it, you, you, we'll loan it to you if, you if you'd like to. But one of the, the key issues is racism. And a pastor was saying, he was saying, why did you put this man in my life? Why did you put this man in my life? And his wife says, you got it all wrong, honey. You got it all wrong. It's, Lord, why have you put me in this man's life? What perspective, isn't it? Change of perspective. Sometimes we need a change of perspective. From why did you put this man in my life to God, why did you put me in this man's life to make change? To make change. Lord, we thank you tonight. Help us with our perspective. Sometimes it's, it's a physical thing. Sometimes it's a mental thing. Sometimes it's an abusive thing. Sometimes it's financial. Sometimes it's just things of the past who just kind of sneak back up on us. But whatever the issue or trial or tribulation that we're facing, help us remember two things. First of all, we're not facing it alone. We face it with you. And second, there's a lot of things that I can't handle on my own but I can do all things through you who gives me strength. So help us to look at everything that comes our way in your perspective. Help us to look at our life, God, in your perspective. Although you don't initiate evil in our life, but you help us to overcome it. You don't initiate sickness, but sometimes it's allowed to build our faith. Sometimes things come our way that it's not what you would want for us. But through it, we can learn that we can depend upon you. And through it, we can learn to get strength from you. First of all, I thank you, Lord, for what you've done in my life. That I was able to let go of, of bitterness and anger and unforgiveness and replace them with love and peace and joy and forgiveness. I thank you for that. But as I look back on it, Lord, it, it became my choice. Not yours. You've already chose the right, the good, the best for us. We need to choose the same. So I pray anybody here tonight or anybody who will be listening to this this week or the next few weeks, that God will sit back and take a different perspective and help us to know that whatever we go through, you're with us all the way. And we'll thank you and praise you in your precious name. Amen and amen and amen.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Tonight, I, I would like to uh, focus on our election coming up in your prayers. Uh, I know there's several things on our list, and if you don't have a list, they're out there in the foyer. But if, uh, if you'd add to whatever you're praying for tonight, just our elections coming up. If any time we need wisdom and guidance, it's now. It's now. And so uh, we just need to pray, seek God. And uh, <laughs> I did, I did a, a wedding last week for a person who's becoming a, a better friend more and more. And he said, who are you going to vote for? And I said, I'm not going to tell you. And he said, well, that means you're going to vote opposite of what I'm thinking. I said, no, I didn't say that. I said, first of all, I'm not going to debate it with you, but I'm going to pray over you that you pray, pray and ask God to seek who you should vote for. Because I'm on track with who I'm voting for. And he said, well, how do I know? He, he was just kind of, I, you know, he's already expressed his, his views many times to me. And I said, well, when you pray about it and you see what the word says and what that candidate stands for, pretty plain, pretty clear cut. <laughs> he said, okay, you're right, you're right. He said, I was just pulling your chain. I said, I knew that already. I knew that already. So just, you know, let's pray for upcoming election that people have wisdom when they go to the polls. We need wisdom. We need guidance and direction. So spend some time in prayer. And when you're done, we've already prayed the prayer of dismissal, but don't leave without spending some time, especially if you're dealing with some of these issues I talked about tonight. Let God just speak to your heart and get a different perspective. Make sure your perspective is God's view and not our own. Because see, God sees the beginning to the end. We just see where we are. We, we saw where we came from and we, we're stymied right there. 